So, you know, I will just be honest with you. Um, this is a work in progress all the time, even with my own parents, but we have found some things that have helped. And I've worked with a lot of patients um, in the past who have obviously they're dealing with these things too, from family members and, and memory issues to just whatever the reason may be. So I think thankfully technology is adding things all the time. Listening to Parent Projects, a family media and technology group production. Now here's your host, Tony Siebers. Hey, welcome in this week. Uh, we've got a, a great guest, which I personally have a great affinity for because it's where my parent project's out of, right? She's based uh, out of Wichita, Kansas, Julie Stover with Advocacy Aging and Healthcare Consultants. Uh, you know, has an opportunity to bring to us from a practitioner standpoint, now laying in what things look like, uh, just just what to expect in, from a doctor's office, how to prepare best when you're walking into one of those solutions, uh, how to handle that situation, how to take something off the backside. Julie Stover, thanks for joining us today on the Pair Projects podcast. And you know, I'm kind of anxious to dive right in with you. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks so much. Let's definitely dive in. <laughs> so look, uh, I guess we'll start with maybe expectations. Maybe you can maybe kind of set a tone for across the board. Uh, you know, in, in our lives, we're, we're used to probably jumping in and the fact that we have really minimal amount of time with mom and dad or with the doctor, Actually, not mom and dad, but minimal amount of time with the doctor when we get in there. The insurance companies and the way that that works, that's probably got a condition that's down there. But I find, you know, mom and dad come at it with a different perspective kind of historically and can you talk us through sometimes just I, how, how do we, what, what's that look like at the base that we should be aware of when we start these conversations and preparing for going to a doctor's office? You know, that's, that's a really great question. And I think the biggest thing that we have to remember too is not only is having that conversation with our parents beforehand, but just trying to set the expectations if you can with them they as you mentioned historically they are so used to something different they're used to having that sit down conversation as long as you need it with their primary care physician or maybe one of their specialists but unfortunately that's just not the case anymore um, as i would say with your pcps you might get the opportunity to talk for more than the six minutes with your specialists they Unfortunately, a lot of times are just checking off boxes and their nurses and are coming in and doing all of the pre-work beforehand. So the more you can have ready going into those appointments, the more chances you have to actually spend time potentially with your doctor and at least getting the information um, to the nurse to share with him so that they are heard to give them a heads up. Um, so it, it's harder than ever uh, because there's quite frankly, there's less providers that are accepting Medicare these yeah. days. And so they're they're in a time crunch too to hurry up and get everybody in that they can. So the more prepared we can be, the better. As far as preparing our parents, yeah. um, the best thing to do, you know, their biggest concern, at least in my experience, and that comes from my professional experience as well as my own personal experience with my parents, is that they are they are so afraid of losing their voice, losing their ability to do things. So I, I make a special effort to really, um, when I'm, whether I'm talking to someone about how to engage with their parents or even with my own, we talk about everything before each appointment and, and, and try to set those expectations with them up front, talk about how they're going to communicate and who's going to do the communicating during the appointment. Um, so that they feel like they're a part of the appointment and that, I'm just not going in there or that other family members not just going in there and doing everything for them. That, that's really great. I, I, so I, you started with something I want to back a little, I, I want to back up a little bit, maybe in setting a baseline, you made a comment about, you know, fewer people are taking Medicare, working off of Medicare. What we start seeing, what, what we've started noticing across the, the country is, is exactly that. We're even seeing some doctor's office that'll maybe stack their Medicare on, on Tuesdays, or they'll stack them on certain days. And those are when they have that, or 
Um, one complaint that we've seen, and, and actually I've experienced this in, in my family, is as soon as they went from insurance covered by the job and went into retirement and went on to Medicare, they found that they got bumped. Like at the la a week before or a week out, they get bumped for somebody conceivably everybody's thinking because it didn't happen before it's for somebody who maybe has different insurances and on medicare has a, a different or a better paying payer model um so so that's a real it's a real thing do you, generally do you do you see that that will continue to increase do you think we'll probably hold firm in that or is that like this is something we just have to prep for that you know six minutes to ten minutes is probably what we're going to have in the foreseeable future so I'm not an expert per se, but what I can see from our own experiences here, just to kind of give you an idea, is there's larger corporations who are, some are trying to move to more of a concierge care model for their employees that are younger than retirement age. And so um, what, what we're seeing is obviously less doctors currently that are accepting Medicare patients. But in the future, we're seeing these uh, employees who've been covered under a concierge care group of primary care doctors. They're gonna get to retirement age and they are going to have a harder time finding a doctor uh. once they're that's gonna accept Medicare and which is gonna put more um, stress and more sure. uh, you know, responsibility on the primary care provider. So I. I Personally, I do not see that this is going to change. I think if anything, it's probably going to get worse yeah. as we move forward, especially with corporations changing the coverage that they're providing for their employees. Okay. So, so if we're going to take into that and we'll, we'll set your, our minds that we're looking for six to 10 minutes to effectively maybe communicate in a, in a meeting, um, you know, I, I, I remember having these conversations in my parent projects with a grandmother of, preparing them for that six to 10 minutes. And they get really kind of frustrated because these things that they used to talk about, you know, that happened at home with their doctors previously, uh, sometimes it was, it was about how they got comfortable, you know, in the first place to have a sensitive conversation. And that, that, that is rough, but some of it to, to, you know, a grandmother's point, it was, it were things that she just felt were impacted. These things going on in my house are impacting how things are happening to me. So, I really like that you talked about not just for their voice, but sitting down and starting to, to make maybe even a list of the top concerns that we do want to talk about. And we we're making sure that we're, we're coming in or that they really want to talk about or focus on uh, of what those major topics are. That's kind of where I got a sense you were you were moving with that. It, am I tracking? Yeah. 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 I think, you know, our our parents, as we both have said, they they're used to having developed a com or being able to have a conversation. And so unfortunately, because there's less time in that, they still want to be able to sit down and have, they want to be able to have that connection point. And then they want to talk about what's going on. Then they might want to bring up anything else that is going on that might not even be related to the reason that you're at the appointment. And unfortunately, not all doctors, they're going to say, well, we're here today to discuss this. So it's sometimes it's about helping that senior family member to develop the mindset of what needs to be discussed and maybe what needs to be something talked about in a different session. And so and, and being as prepared as you can to you can walk into that appointment and have a if have a list of things that you want to talk about what symptoms are being experienced with those particular with that particular concern and making sure that you have other documentation that you know they're going to ask because if it's a medicare patient they're going to always ask about um, your current medications. They're always going to, you know, they're, have you had your current, all of your vaccinations? If it's at someone who's diabetic, they're going to ask, what has your blood sugar been? And have you been logging that? So there's just certain things that they're always going to ask. And those are those things that after you've been to the appointments at least a couple of times, you know what they're going to ask and you can start to have those ready before you even get to the appointment so that it allows more conversational time. That's great. And, you know, as we, we do look at effective use of technology, my hope would be we get to more and more of that can be collected maybe ahead of time. Wearables or other things that happen remotely can, can send those things in ahead of the conversation so that we effectively get the most amount of time of having that contextual conversation with them. So, okay, so we've, so we've established a good list of what we want to talk about. 
uh, and we maybe understand who's going to start talking about something, what do we need to know about who gets to talk about something when you get to a doctor's office? Uh, you know, how do you, if you know you're coming with mom and dad, uh, will they, will they, what, what are the best ways to make that happen? Let me say that. Let me, you know, knowing that every doctor's office really gets that opportunity to control how that's going to go down and you're, you just kind of have to vote with your feet and what's a good fit for you. What, um, what are things you can do to set yourself up for success documentation wise? So I think, first of all, as far as the communication that happens, how do you decide who's going to talk? I think it's really important for you to have a, a really, um, for that, whoever is taking the parent to their appointment to really have a good idea of what that parent's and I'm going to say cognitive level, but how are they able to communicate? How are they able to answer questions about their current situation and their concerns? Um, for me, in my situation, um, my parents are forgetting more and my parents are having a more difficult time, even if we're going over things beforehand. So we sit down and have a conversation and talk about um, what are the things that I'm going to talk about or I'm, you're going to answer these questions. And are you okay with me jumping in and filling in the gaps if you're not able to provide all the information the doctor is asking? So making sure that I'm setting that ahead of time. But also I think I've noticed even with my own parents um, that because we have a health history that's already been prepared, so we can go in and we just add to it any time that there's a next appointment. So if there's been anything new that's happened, we just add to that health history and we can hand that over to the nurse because those are those things that, that the nurse is gonna ask about. And then we also go over their medications. Um, most doctors will say, you can do, uh, they'll say, oh, just you know, put all your medications in a bag and bring them to the appointment. Well, <laughs> most of the time that works, but a lot of times it's kind of a pain and it's, more work for the professionals that are there trying to get through everything to get the doctor on his schedule. And so what we've done is develop um, a pretty detailed medical list. And I keep, and it is literally even organized by color code as far as what the medicine is for. So if it's for cardiac, it's pink. If it's for diabetes, it's blue or whatever the case may be. But it breaks down every bit of information. And I can't tell you how many times we've gone in and they're just like, thank you so much. And I mean, and it, it cuts because all they have to go in and do is say, oh, yeah, this is still current. This is still current. This is still current. And they're not trying to figure out what they are and aren't taking and, and what the milligrams are. So it, it helps, again, um, be prepared for the meeting or for the visit. But then also it really helps you to have a little bit more time with the doctor when they come in. Well, in the context, too, of what all you're on, right, as you, especially as you get older, and you have multiple symptoms or you might be dealing with multiple things and those those medications can start conflicting. You want to treat one thing in one particular way, but that would cause you to have to not take one particular medication you know, it for, for a prolonged period of time, but you really value what that medication is doing and you don't want to come off of that thing. So uh, it allows those conversations to come through with a little more context. I, I've seen, I, I love that approach. I mean, we've literally seen that in uh, in our family, in, in our family parent projects personally too, where it's it's allowed them to not to be seen as, as being obstinate to what the doctor is stating, but being able to show, well, it's because I don't want to come off of this thing. If I come off of this, I don't like this side effect. And it allowed them to find a middle ground that they were going to do. So I, I love documenting and having that ready because that could be, yeah, that bag is almost, it's, it's, well, it takes a lot of time, honestly, even receiving it. it means they have to document it and write it down and pull each one out. And having that already is most usable. That's fantastic. You know, the other thing too, I would really encourage family members to do is, is don't be afraid to ask questions, um, you know, about the meds. A lot of times, at least with the age group that my parents are in, they, you know, they just kind of um, grew up in a time where you just did whatever the doctor told you to do. And you bring up a very good point. What if there's something that's conflicting uh, because these doctors are sometimes having to move so fast through appointments, they may miss something. So earmark those things that you have questions on, or, you know, it, um, at one point, uh, I had a family member that was on multiple diabetes meds. And I said, is there a reason why we're on three diabetes meds? Aren't they all contributing to the same thing? Can we cut? And, and you know, and two of them are extremely expensive. So I said, is there any reason why we can't cut these? Is, you know, 
do one instead of three, something like that. So write those questions down before the appointment so that when you do get in there and things are moving really fast, you've got those earmarked to ask those types of questions. Boy, and that time does move really fast. Can you talk to me about as we push through HIPAA, right, and, and, and healthcare information and those protocols that come around healthcare information today, what are some of those things we need to be prepared for document-wise uh, to walk in there and to really advocate well for a family member that you've seen? So, I you know, everybody is very familiar with every time uh, they're going into a doctor's office for the first time every year, you've got to fill out your HIPAA form. I mean, that's for any patient. You've got to fill that out. What I have really had to ingrain in the people that I've helped as well as my parents is, is literally reminding them, oh, it's that time of year, you've got to fill out that HIPAA form. But that's not just it. I think a lot of families think that that's the only thing that's needed. And in reality, and I'm not a legal expert by any means, but I've yeah. learned from my own experiences, um, you've got to have a medical POA put in place, especially if your family member is not at, able to solely take care of all of their medical decisions or financial decisions themselves. So you need to look into have um, a, a medical and financial POA, but those documents need to come with you. You also, and, and they, a lot of times in the doctor's offices and definitely with insurance, they will have it, they will refer to it as an authorized representative. Yeah. And so you've got to have that. And, and what I have even found out my own self recently is not just letting the medical side. So uh, if, you, if they have to go to the hospital or they go to the ER, make sure that you've got that authorized representative indicated on their file, both in the medical side and in the billing department. And if it's the insurance company, unfortunately, they don't all speak together within different teams under one big umbrella. Right. So you may be dealing with the branch that, have, um, that covers all the pharmacy stuff. You need to make sure that your authorized representative is indicated there. You also have to do the same thing with each area of an insurance. But as far as the medical appointments, always make sure the HIPAA form is signed and the right people are indicated so they can share information. But then also make sure your authorized representatives have been set up. And that way they can call and ask questions. Um, not only attend the appointments and receive information, but I can't tell you how many times I have to be the one to call and ask the questions to do the follow-up. Yeah. Um, just had to call the cardiologist mm -hmm. today and they can't talk to you if your parent hasn't indicated you as an authorized rep. So it's extremely important that you get those pieces set up and it seems very repetitive, but if those aren't set up and set up every year, they will not be able to share anything or answer any questions, even about billing. And that will be the same for telemedicine uh, as it is mm -hmm. for, for in-person, right? So mm -hmm. definitely having those together. Um, and then uh, anything else that we should be taking with us? So we've got that stuff set aside. We make sure we've got those power of attorney side. Uh, I will note too, sometimes dealing with the insurance side, there's a finance touch to that. And they're gonna look for you as you're dealing with it to have that financial capability to deal with medical finance, right? Um, yeah. and, or won't talk to you about the bill and work across it that way. It, it can be maddening, but just prepping these things, you know, again, preparation ahead of time, just key. It sounds like a, just a lot of key to, to making this things go well. Oh yeah. Trust me. They, they know who I am. They're like, Oh no, here she comes. Because when I'm bringing in one of my parents for appointment, because I, I'm just, I'm ready with the questions. And I usually have a question around billing. Yeah. I usually have a question around, you know, something. So they, they, but they actually appreciate it. I always think that I probably annoy them all, but I think they usually appreciate people who come pre more prepared yeah. and it, it does help them figure out a solution or figure out an answer a little bit easier too. Well, and, and I can say if, if you're having, if you're having a difficult time working with a loved one and getting through this, maybe you're really emotionally, maybe it's something that emotionally bothers you to watch your loved one go through. Uh, mm -hmm. and this might be a really good time to look into having a healthcare advocate start to tackle some of those things. If you're having a difficult right. time communicating Clearly with the doctor, you get in an adversarial conversation or something gets ugly from that. You know, again, don't don't be afraid to, to call in the cavalry or to, this might be a good opportunity to have a professional that can come into it without that emotion. Not saying that the emotions definitely not warranted. You got your emotion, your emotions there for a reason off of that. But being able to choose that person who can help you communicate most effectively 
and being okay if that's not you. It could be okay if that's not you. Uh, finding the you know people that are out there that can do that, and, and you know you guys, it seems like that's exactly something that you guys are there to be able to do for families if they're struggling with that too. No, that's exactly right, and and that's that's what we want to do and and help families who don't have someone that can do that, or maybe uh, you know the adult children are living out of town and they can't physically be at those appointments. So we hope to provide that kind of support. And what I will say is this, uh, you know, as a practitioner myself, um, as whenever someone would bring in an advocate early on in my career, everybody gets nervous when there's someone there that they're not. And it, um, and it's how you choose to work with them. And what we choose to do is to work with the healthcare professionals. And I, I've gone in and sat in on meetings, care plan meetings with families who's have, who have someone in skilled rehab or in a skilled nursing. And I cannot tell you, I don't even go in and say, I'm a speech language pathologist. I just have the family introduce me. And this is our advocate that's just sitting in as an extra pair of ears. There's just something about having someone else in there that's listening sometimes that makes everybody else stand up and go, oh, I guess we really need to be careful and make sure that we're advocating in the best way for this member. So sometimes, some not all, but yeah. sometimes it does help the the staff that you're working with too to think, okay, well, they're taking this seriously. Yeah. Well, and nothing else. Because unfortunately, for, not all families do. <laughs> right. Well, and and just to slow well, or to slow the game down. Right. It is fast. Right. There is a churn, and they are just like any of us in our workplace. It can be easy to get caught up in the run of the workplace, right? And so mm-hmm. having that other person there kind of check up, it's something different. It causes, you know, people to be aware of what are going on. They're looking, they're looking to the left and right. And that, that could be, that could be a good thing. Not even an adversarial thing. So don't be afraid of that. It's, it really can be seen as just that. Um, no, exactly. It, just, it breaks up the mundane. It breaks up the routine mm-hmm. a bit. Gets people to pay attention. Well, I want to take a quick break real fast. We, um, and, 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 and here when we come back uh, from the break, we're going to break down on a follow-up managing that family calendar of appointments, some ideas and, and being able to work through all of that, as well as how do you prepare for that emergency and that ER visit that might pop up? What stuff do you have on standby so you can go in the split of the moment? Stay tuned for the Parent Projects podcast. We'll be right back after this message. Hey, welcome back this week. We have Julie Stover with Advocacy Aging and Healthcare Consultants out of the Wichita, Kansas, if you happen to be in the Wichita, Kansas market. But we're tackling from, from healthcare advocacy as families and how do we help manage our parents' doctor's appointments? How do we set that up and put everybody in the best place to, to really help mom and dad have that voice for themselves? Julie, again, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. The, um, the, 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 really what I want to make that corner and come home in happens for a couple of things. A, just the calendar of planning. Now we're going to, we're going to get into the, the practicality of some of those things. Some, some tips about managing, you have some great stuff about how, you know, I, I picked out of that. I heard what you were saying and, you know, keeping a running log of just what we, what we have for those medical conditions. We're just adding these events onto it in that running, you know, lo- that log for us to keep up to date on having our medications documented ahead of time, you know, again, uh, starting earlier than often and preparing for it. How about managing a family calendar? What, what are some of the points to really be thinking about that when you're dealing with maybe multiple hands that are, that are in the pot for this, helping mom advocate for herself or dad advocate for himself as they get up there? So, you know, I will just be honest with you. Um, this is a work in progress all the time, even with my own parents, but we have found some things that have helped. And I've worked with a lot of patients um, in the past who have obviously they're dealing with these things too, from family members and, and memory issues to just whatever the reason may be. So I think thankfully technology is adding things all the time. What we have found is two things. One that's extremely basic and one that um, thankfully we have smartphones. So we have, there's different family calendar apps that are out there and my parents are technology challenged. So I have to find the most user-friendly one that's out there. But 
I can go in and, and put in their appointments. And because I would say as my parents are aging, that is the hardest thing uh, for them to, to remember. And because there's so many appointments that come up, sometimes you go through waves, I feel like. Yeah. And so sometimes there's more. <laughs> and so we, um, we use a family calendar um, app that sends them reminders um, it, all the time. Um, and I mean, you can even use your Google calendars and share those. That's something right. that's simple. But the other thing that's really basic is we have dry erase boards um, and we have a couple of them throughout the house. And so every, um, you know, one thing that I do or I encourage other people to do is if, if there's, if memory is an issue or just keeping track of things, we put visual reminders around all the time. And so, um, whether it is reminding about pills and bills, uh, which is what we refer to it in our house, but also um, just reminders of appointments, things like that. Um, and, and there's one that's right when they're going out the door and there's one right when they're walking into their bedroom. And so those are the two places they have to hit every day almost. So um, I think it's hard for parents. It's hard to be the adult child and feel like how am I, especially for those um, you know adult children who have their own families, you're tracking your own family's calendars and then your parents too. And so you have to find a way that's gonna be able to help you navigate through those appointments. Um, but then also make sure that you're not overlapping as well, because yeah. as I said, it goes in waves. And uh, at least with my parents in the last year, they never seem to be able to do things one at a time. It always ends up that they're doing everything all at the same time. And so in order to maintain my sanity, uh, we we use the a family calendar app and then we also have visual reminders all the time in the house. Well, and some, some principles that we see there, uh, it just, just the same way that we get fatigued from that, they get fatigued as well. I get it, get into the car, getting ready, getting prepared for it. So having, you know, it, it, sometimes it makes sense. You're like, okay, I'm going to squeeze all of this and I'm going to fly in. We're getting them all done Thursday and Friday. We've got Saturday and Sunday. I got to fly back out and I'm headed back to where I'm going, particularly if we're out of state. And that makes a really, really rough. I mean, thir you know, Thursday and Friday as it comes up in the back to back to back and, and you really don't have a lot of room. In fact, the pressure turns on if you've grouped them together that way, um, by the time you're getting to Friday, if they're really getting tired, you don't have, you don't, you don't have that leeway. So giving yourself that space and giving them, I think that space in the planning is, is a, a good thing and having it visualized out there. I love, I, I really like that idea outside the bedroom, as well as by the front door, as things come through your, for your pills and bills side, uh, the bedroom's a great one. Going to bed at night, it is amazing what uh, how the effect of that can have in clearing a conscience of, yeah, I'm going to go to bed and tomorrow morning this is what I'm going to face or this is this is what's coming at that. I see where that thing could be. Uh, it 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 helps us feel good of what we're going to do tomorrow to have that thought. The same that's not going to change as we get a little bit older. We see uh, we see that continue. So love those recommendations. Um, I, one other thing I wanted to point out uh, in what you were saying there that I know we've worked with, especially in parent projects, which obviously has a medical calendar and messaging and, and works for these things for these and stuff. So uh, a little bit of self-promotion, I guess, off of that side. But one of the, I, I think what's most important there is you, you talked about that information of, you know, that you guys would enter that information for them and then they can see the calendar appointment. Thinking about how each person's going to interact with technology is is important so when selecting what that is if if they're overwhelmed where that is but all they really need to do is know when the calendar is coming up look for a good calendar look for a good application that's going to communicate to them just when things are and allow them the ability to see if there's somebody who needs to see a week in advance awesome if they're just somebody who needs to be in the moment and know what's happening at me today think through that what level of detail do you show well think about what they can handle Maybe they don't need to Keep know. <laughs> Maybe you could hold some of that down in the notes or in another place mm -hmm. and those things, but, but gauge that family member. And, and I would say, ask them what they really want to know and then give them what they're asking for and continue to, to uh, if they ask for more, then, then add that more in there. But, but play at that side of ease, uh, especially when we're talking about technology. But I really like, I liked how you talked about that when things came up. That's that's uh, fantastic on the uh, on the family calendars and stuff. Okay, so look, 
here's the one you can't plan for. Or maybe you can, uh-huh. right? That is, <laughs> that is that ER visit. And talk to me about that. What do you, this is the only time you're going to see me smile about it. And that's because after that, <laughs> like, thank God we survived it. Like, huh, that is, I didn't see that coming. And it's always the thing you, the individual incidents, the thing you didn't see coming, right? Those, the ones you thought might come down, those are easy to prepare for. But what, what can you do to prepare at home? What are you guys telling people uh, and working with families with to prepare ahead of an ER visit um, so that they can handle it most effectively? And maybe let's start with if you're available, maybe you're there, you're able, you, you live within you know a short drive distance so you can be there for it. And, and then maybe you could talk about that if you're not, if you're remote yeah. you're having to deal with that. Yeah. Before. So I would... If you're there, or even if you if you're doing this to prepare for your parents, because if you're remote and you can't go there with them, then they need to have this. But one thing that I always have ready, and I've always encouraged people that I've worked with to do, um, is you just you always have a packet. I mean, I literally walk around with a packet of information all the time um, if I'm going somewhere or or ready to go uh, with my parents um, that's ready for doctor's appointments and ready for ER visits. Um, So what that means is, is have that the same type of stuff that we talked about for your doctor's visits, because quite frankly, your doctor visits are going to be hopefully with a familiar doctor. So you may not have to regurgitate all the same information all the time. An ER visit, uh, if you, oh, yeah. you may go to the same location, but in most cases, you're gonna be dealing with an entirely different staff every time. The only thing, the only exception to that is if you're going to an ER within the same hospital system every single time that's gonna have all of your information together, but don't assume that that they're gonna look at everything. So some of the same things that we talked about for a doctor visit make sure you have a health history along with everything that's happened recently um same thing any type of accidents any type of falls they're always going to ask about falls if there's been any recent falls and so that's probably a whole nother conversation about how to talk to your parents about those but um but you've got to have that information because yeah. a lot of times they don't share no uh, I, oh you, yeah yeah I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I have a i'll throw it in for the for the levity of it all i remember having a client that they had had a whole issue on a fall where they had she had uh he had fallen out in the dining room couldn't get up she ends up finally finding him falls trying to help him get up. They both get stuck on the ground and it isn't until a fire starts in the kitchen that oh he goodness. musters this, you know, that a panic energy that rolls himself over and he's able to get up and to work through all of that. And what they really wanted to tell me about it was that the kids never found out. And I mean, it, they just giggled oh. beside themselves funny about that. And I'm like, man, what is, what it gets kept from me. So creating, how do you create that you know, it's, it's like an art and a science of creating the safe space yeah. for your parents to tell you that stuff so you can be prepared at that moment. And maybe this is a good one saying, hey, in the case of an ER visit, they're going to ask us this. Can you write it in your <laughs> squirrel place and let me know where to get it when I need it or what? You know, I'm, I'm... Oh, it's so hard because <clears throat> from from what I've experienced so far, when they admit they've had a fall, that's saying, oh, no. You know, one more nail in my coffin, one more uh, nail in, yeah. and, and you thinking I can't do things on my own or I can't do things independently. So it is a consistent conversation. I thought in my own experience, in my own situation, I thought it might get easier because one of my family members had a change in medication, uh, a blood and was put on a different blood thinner. And so literally any time that family member has a fall, we get to go to the ER yeah. because we have to have a CT scan to make sure there's no internal bleeding. And I thought, well, maybe now I'll find out, but it doesn't, they yeah. still, it's, it's just, they are, they don't want that independence taken away. Yeah. And so for me, it's a constant conversation of explaining why this is important and how telling me is going to actually help them maintain their independence so that we can provide more information to the medical professionals. Because if they don't know what hasn't happened, they can't help. 
yeah. and they can't look for the problem. So that's how I position it is if you, if I don't know, we can't find out if there's something wrong yeah. and then something goes and you know, we don't see it or we don't find out about it. Or we don't get a CT or an X-ray or whatever. And then it could become something worse. So that's how I combat that issue. It doesn't always work, but mm -hmm. it, it is, it does help occasionally. But, but with ERs, if you can, if you have the luxury of going to an ER that's within the same hospital system that you go to, it is a little easier. Okay. Um, but again, make sure you have all that information, your medical history, your pharmacy uh, information. And one thing I didn't mention before about the pharmacy list, I actually uh, at the bottom and anytime there is a change or they've discontinued a medication or put it on hold, I move it to the bottom of the list and gray it out because they may have a question at an ER visit, at a hospital visit, or at a doctor visit saying, have they taken this drug or have they had any issues with this drug when they took this? And so I keep that information on our drug list, um, but I make sure that they understand it's discontinued because they may go in and, and maybe they've had a fall and they're in pain and they go ahead and give them a pain medication, but they had a reaction to that last time. Sure. Well, I've got that information on my sheet. So having that type of information is helpful. Um, have insurance information and again, have that POA. So having that packet of information that has the, all the, the medical history, the medications and the history of the medications, any type of financial arrangements, medical POA, anything like that, that just needs to be ready to in a folder to go with you anytime or with that parent, anytime they go so that you can just walk in and hand that to them. Um, that's very helpful. But unfortunately, preparing your, your family member that they are going to have to regurgitate a lot of information. And that's just part of it because you're dealing with new staff. Yeah. So, but, but do not, what I will say is um, do not be afraid to make sure that they've understood and that they've, you've, that they've understood what your concerns are and why you're there that day. Um, a lot of times, they're in a hurry too. They're trying to get people in and out of that ER so quickly. And there's so many other things going on. And a lot of times, depending on what the issue is, the seniors sometimes get moved into a room really fast, depending on what the issue is, but they're wanting to move them out or move them up to the hospital as soon as possible. Right. So, um, and setting expectation, there's nothing that drives, I'm sure anyone as crazy as having to sit in an ER for hours and trying to get that parent to realize I mean, now what I deal with is my dad doesn't want to tell me anything because he's like, I don't want to have to go sit in that ER for four to five hours. So it's just setting those expectations and know that it's just part of what we're doing right now, unfortunately, and having being as prepared as possible for those types of visits to help cut down on incorrect information and yeah. get to exactly what's needed. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Hey, where can we, where can our listeners get more information or those that are in the Wachita area, get more information, Julie, on you and what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. You can email us right now. Um, we are uh, rebuilding our website right now. So we um, you can reach us via email at aahconsultantsforseniors at gmail.com. And we, um, we're glad to help with whatever we can at this time. We're not, we're, we don't know everything, but we've had a lot of experience ourselves um, through the years in helping advocate for seniors and their family members. So please reach out. Brilliant. And we will, obviously, this is a living episode. So if you look down in the show notes down below, we'll put more information. We will update when that new uh, web address comes out. We'll be sure to update that and have that down in the in the address below. So just check out the comments down below. You can see it. Uh, if you're looking for the original content off of Facebook or off of Facebook or off of YouTube, you can find that over on parentprojects.com and Parent Projects Podcast. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and from that, boy, Julie, that wonderful, wonderful breakdown. Really appreciated all that. I feel pretty darn prepared at managing my parents' doctor's appointments now. So I appreciate you coming in and doing yeah. that. Absolutely. No problem. And uh, one other recommendation, Please. have your packet ready when you're traveling with your uh, parent yeah. too. Yes. <laughs> We've dealt with that one too. So mm -hmm. make sure you take that packet with you if you're traveling. Okay. Okay. Um, Boy, again, thank you so much, Julie, for sharing your time, talents, and treasures with us here on the Parent Projects Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me.
Well, that's it for the team this week. And thanks for joining us. If you've enjoyed the content, remember to subscribe and to share this episode on the app that you're using right now. Your reviews and your comments, they really help us expand our reach as well as our perspective. So if you have time, also drop us a note. Let us know how we're doing. For tips and tools to clarify your parent project, simplify communication with your stakeholders, and verify the professionals that you choose, you can find us on YouTube, follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Thanks again for trusting us until our next episode. Behold and be held. Thank you for listening to this Parent Projects podcast production. To access our show notes, resources, or forums, join us on your favorite social media platform or go to parentprojects.com. This show is for informational and educational purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional credential in your local area. This show is copyrighted by Family Media and Technology Group Incorporated and Parent Projects LLC. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcast.